evening, good night, good afternoon, whatever time zone you're in, whatever time of day you are, welcome to Life Mastery TV, your source for inspiration, empowerment, and fulfillment. My name is David McLeod. I am your Life Mastery Coach and author of the book, A Life to Die For. Today, we are embarking on episode number 180. This is called Weathering Misunderstandings. And I'd like to just invite anybody who's, uh, who's here for the live presentation, feel free during the conversation uh, between uh, Linda and me to uh, share your comments or questions in the chat area, and we will get to them uh, as soon as we can. Uh, and we prefer that you stay off camera if you don't mind. I've had a few people now just kind of pop on camera by accident, so I'd, I'd request that you don't do that. So let's get to it. True communication is an art, an exercise in sharing and mutual understanding. If we wish to create the kind of life we truly desire, which actually involves many relationships with a lot of different people, then we must master two critical skills. One, listening to understand, and two, speaking to be understood. Now that sounds pretty simple on the surface, doesn't it? And yet, it seems clear that with so many misunderstandings, disagreements, conflicts, and even wars that have taken place in our history and continue to this day, something is amiss with our collective ability to communicate. What on earth are we doing wrong? Well, this is indeed a massively huge problem in the world, and we're not likely to solve it in a single episode of Life Mastery TV, but each of us can do our part to improve our own communication skills. And by doing so, we cannot help but contribute to a better world. My guest today is a neuroscience and mindset expert and award-winning speaker who has presented across the country at places like the New York City Bar Association, the Harvard Club of Boston, Walmart, and Carnegie Hall. After healing from an abusive marriage and navigating the diagnosis and eventual death of her three-year-old daughter, she found her way to bounce back and reclaim her joy in life. Today, she helps successful women defeat the dragons in their lives and elevate their joy to new levels. So please join me in welcoming the queen of joy, Linda Shively, to our show today. Welcome, Linda. Thank you so much for coming back on the show. I know it's, uh, it's been a while, but it's always a great delight to have you here. And I'm waiting for your camera to come on. Are you there? Very far. I clicked it. I'm here. Well, uh, yes. Well, you know, that's the nature of technology. It sometimes responds in its own time. You know how it yeah, is. Yes. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me again. It's it's great to be back. Yeah. You know, by now, I don't know. I think you have been on my show more than anybody else. Woohoo! Uh, with the possible exception of Sarah, uh, Sarah Jane. Uh, you guys are probably in close, uh, you know, close alignment in terms of how many times you've been guests. And uh, so that's awesome. And, uh, you know, I'm really glad to have you here again. And now I'm wondering, now, since you've been on the show so many times, it's possible that some of the listeners here have already learned a little bit about you and know something about what you do. But I'm wondering if you might share a little bit about your journey that helped you to come to this place where where this topic, this topic about communication has become so important to you. Back in December of 2005, I had to make a very challenging decision. I had to figure out how to escape an abusive marriage with my severely handicapped three-year-old daughter, Jessica. And communication was a challenge. I struggled. I never knew what I needed to do how to say what I needed to say because everything was twisted and turned. Before I talk about that though, I wanna talk about Jessica. Jessica, she's a bright eyed, happy little girl and has so much joy. She loves to read, she loves to play with her friends and zoom around in her power chair with the strength of her index finger. And I say that because she had a condition called spinal muscular atrophy. It's a progressive neuromuscular disorder that affects the ability to crawl, walk, swallow, and even breathe. She did have strength, 
very little strength in her index finger and could power around her power chair, zooming around, navigating things that I don't know how she did it, but when you want to move, you figure out a way. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and as I said, she brought me so much joy, but my marriage kept me on high alert on the other hand. And it was like walking on eggshells. I never knew when he was going to explode. I never knew what to say to try and keep things calm. And I thought, okay, if I do what he wants, that'll help, but that didn't work. So that struggle was real and not knowing not having the great tools at the time to be able to navigate that situation severely impacted the relationship and severely right. impacted mm -hmm. my confidence. And it wasn't a healthy place for me to be. It wasn't a healthy place for me to raise my daughter. And I didn't know how to, what I was going to do, where I was going to go because she needed so much care. There were nurses, it, it was like a mini ICU in her room, intensive care unit in her room. And I figured out, I finally figured out a way. And so on a Tuesday, I brought her home from preschool, put her down for a nap and looked at her nurse and said, okay, you pack all of her medical equipment. I'm going to pack her clothes and her toys. And as soon as she wakes up, we're going to escape. So after a flurry of activity, she wakes up. And we leave exactly two weeks later, two days after Christmas, I hold Jessica in my arms as she takes her last breath mm. and dies. From that moment on, I struggled. I struggled to see any kind of future for myself. And I struggled for 10 years to really make sense of it. What, what do I do? How do I stop the overwhelm how do i get focused how do i move forward and how can i communicate better in the future and i realized there were some missing pieces and the biggest missing piece that we all need but we don't always realize we need it is true joy and I know that sounds hard to believe because you're like, wait, but grief and yeah, you can have both joy and grief, but true joy isn't that, oh, I'm going to plaster on a smile. I'm happy. Yay. Everything is wonderful. It's coming from that deep place where you really can connect with other people. You can see the gratitude. You can find the, the deeper meaning in life. And from that place, I have built my own business, coached and spoken across the country and spoken to people around the world and really give them that hope that you can do more. And so I know we're talking about communication today. And so let's figure out let's get curious about communication and see what we can see what we can talk about that'll help our listeners yeah. in their lives well sure and we will do that for sure but before we go there i just want to you know i want to i want to bless you and honor you for making a very very difficult choice in your life back in i think you said 2006 is that right 2005 2005 i'm sorry and yeah, that's a tough choice to make, especially when you've got, you know, a, a highly dependent uh, young child with you. And then to have her leave as well after that happens, you know, with only two weeks after you or before Christmas, I guess. And it's that's I mean, the whole thing just really sounds painful to me. And I just want to you know, bless you and honor you for for going through that and finding your way back to your joy, which I see all the time. You know, I mean. I've been on your list for quite a while. So I'm seeing your your uh, your posts. I'm seeing stuff on LinkedIn. I mean, I see your energy. And uh, I've also gotten to know you personally from living in California and uh, and being part of the same Toastmasters club. So I've gotten to know you there as well. And so, yeah, it's been 
really beautiful to watch this transition uh, on on some level, and to see you now blossoming into a, a you know a world renowned coach and speaker. I think that's that's really awesome. So I just wanted to honor that. Thank you. Yeah. 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 It, and um, and you're right. It's I think nice, it's nice to be witnessed by someone who has has seen that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I know what you mean. It it, it is. It's it is good to uh, to be witnessed. I see we have a comment from Marissa. Thank you, uh, Marissa, for this. She says, thank you for sharing such an inspiring and touching story with us, Linda. I can only imagine how challenging it must have been to go through it all. Absolutely. Yeah. It's, yeah thank uh, you, Marissa. Yeah, it's not the sort of thing that anybody would wish for. Uh, but after it's all over, you can go back and you can look at the blessings that have come out of it. And I know you have done that. And a, lot, a big part of your message it, for people has to do with you know, the blessings that can come out of going through a grieving process. And uh, and I've found a lot of what you have uh, shared so very inspiring. And that's one of the reasons that I love having you on this show. So, and yes, so today we're going to get to see the Queen of Joy talking about communication. And uh, this communication is one of my favorite topics, as I've, uh, as I've told you before. And, and I mentioned Toastmasters here a moment ago, and I want to, I'm going to bring it up again because Toastmasters, for anybody who is a little bit nervous about communication, Toastmasters is a great tool for learning how to express yourself and also learning how to listen to other people. So if you if you have some challenges in that regard, I really encourage you to go check it out. You know, find a club in your neighborhood and check it out because you can you can learn a lot of great skills there and you meet some great people like Linda and me. <laughs> anyway, uh, yeah. So let's talk about communication. And what do you think is the most important element of communication to, you know, that, that actually makes it work? The biggest piece, well, gosh, there's so many, there are so many pieces that make communication work. Curiosity, I think, is one of the most helpful pieces in communication. And I say that because when we don't understand something and we begin to make it, make up our own meaning about it, that's where things go sideways <laughs> very quickly. Exactly. And so getting, getting curious, getting clear, making sure the other person is clear, because that's where the disconnect often happens. Right. And that's where misunderstandings come into play, which is what we're talking about today. Yeah, I think curiosity is a great word. And um, when I think of curiosity in terms of communication, it's more about trying to help in my the way I the way I see it. OK, when I'm having a conversation, say, with you, the idea of curiosity is not to find out more of the gory details, but rather about trying to understand more what it means for you. What, it, what, what is this all about for you? And you get to choose. When I ask, when I show, pure, when I show true curiosity and, and ask the right kinds of questions, then you get to share whatever it is you want to share, gory details or not. And that way, you know, so we have to be really careful and, and re remember that the reason for curiosity is to help the other person deepen their own understanding and express the truth cut for them. It's not about, you know, making it about me. It's not because I need to know anything. It's just about the helping the other person. Right. Right. And when I say curiosity, it's not, um, I don't mean nosy. Exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, curiosity about the meaning of exactly something. Yeah. And, and curiosity, I think this applies across the board. It's not just when we're in communication, you know, it's fine to be curious about something. You can you can ask people questions, but you don't want to be prying. You know, this is not about, you know, as I said, it's not about the gory details. It's really just about trying to create that connection. It's curiosity for the purpose of deepening the connection. That's really right. what it's about. Right. Yeah, because I find so to me, 
there if there are two people talking, one person has the idea in their mind and they have this image or representation that they have in their head of what they're trying to express. And they say, blah, blah, blah to the other person. And the other person hears, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> Right. Because they have all of their filters and understandings and how the information comes in. And so they don't have, they're not actually hearing what was said in the manner in which it was meant. And their internal representation of whatever it is, is something completely different. So therefore, they're talking, they're not even talking about the same topic they're not talking about the same issue they're not talking about whatever it is it, it's there's a disconnect right. that that is the failure of communication and that that's why i talk about curiosity because if this person gets this understanding of like oh you're talking about you know this is all about me you're blaming me for something and you know or you're Perhaps you've heard the expression of resting bored face and, or perhaps a different word in the middle, but you know, when as a speaker or a teacher or a presenter, anytime you're talking to somebody, you look at somebody and the expression on their face may not actually represent the, what you're hoping it to be. So everybody always wants like somebody to be like fully engaged and happy and listening to them intently. And sometimes when we're listening intently, we may have a, an expression that's not very pleasant to look at, you know, just like, mm. <laughs> and I've, I've had this experience where I've had a conversation with somebody. I know the person, they're a wonderful human being. They're very curious. They're very interesting. But if I'm presenting and they're in my audience, I try not to look at them because they just have this like very serious, but they're taking notes and they're very intent. If you don't know that you think, oh, they're bored or they're not interested in what I'm saying or whatever you make up in your mind about what you're seeing. I was on a call with somebody who, and this was on Zoom where they looked away when we were talking. And everybody in the group was kind of like, why aren't you paying attention? You know, you're, you're, you're disrespecting us. This is, we're all engaged mm -hmm. here. And he said, I have trouble hearing and I have to really concentrate. And so I'm, I look away so that I can hear better and so that I can really concentrate. And everybody went, oh, okay. But everybody made up this story in their head about what was happening. Right. And, well, and how often do we allow those stories in our head to interrupt the conversation? You know, uh, you know, you might say something to me and immediately I can relate to, to a similar situation in my own life. So I start talking about that. I'm not really listening to you at all. I'm just waiting for my opportunity to dive in and share my experience. And that's, that's a lot of what happens in, in many low-level communication uh, situations. Uh, each person seems to be intent on speaking rather than hearing anything. And, uh, okay, there's a time and place to speak. And I think I have to take responsibility for what I say as well. But you're right. I think it's easy for, for anybody but I'll speak in first person singular because I believe that's the right way to communicate. It's easy for me to fall into the bad habit of saying, oh yeah, I remember a situation like that. Let me tell you about it. And all of a sudden we have completely derailed the conversation. And that is not communication anymore, right? Or maybe uh, something else might happen. I might hear you say, uh, oh, you're talking about, let's say your, your, your abusive marriage and I might, say something really stupid, like, well, what did you do, do to get him upset? You know, I'm trying to di diagnose the situation as if I have any clue about what might have been going on. And I'm relating that back to a situation that might have happened in my life earlier on, where I got blamed for something, you see? 
And it's this is the problem that we have in communication. We have to stop that stuff and bring ourselves fully present. When the other person is speaking, we have to open our hearts and just listen. And if any speaking happens at all on my part, it's just about, oh, that sounds really painful. Do you want to tell me more about that? Or whatever, you know. Uh, I, I don't want to put too much of my own stuff on it, but it sounds like you were really struggling at that time. I might just say that. And then you can say, yeah, it was a real struggle. But the idea is not to derail the conversation in any way, to do any diagnosing, to do any uh, change of direction or anything. It's all about just listening and listening from a place of empathy and, and support. I think the other word that's a key in communication that you just said is present. Yeah. Because when we are fully present, then because you don't know what the other person is going to say. That's right. And they may say something. And even if you thought, oh, I want to tell them about X, Y, Z. But then they said something about ABC and you're like, oh. We need to talk about that. Forget that. <laughs> exactly. Yes. And yeah, sometimes you have to say, okay, that was just about me, that little X, Y, Z thing. That was just about me. We don't need to talk about that. When it's my turn to speak, maybe then I'll bring it up. But it's not important right now. Mm -hmm. Let's move on. And so that's the, the, the idea that we're trying to convey here is communication. It's called calm communication because it means that our two, two people are kind of interacting with each other in a, in using dialogue right and and body language and voice uh, uh, variations and so forth so yeah we are communicating even when we're not saying anything and I think you know you mentioned something about listening and um, I just wanted to draw a little bit of attention to it I think it's perfectly fine to listen without saying anything, but I personally find it easier to stay engaged if I'm, if I, if, if I have the other person's permission to, to reflect back what I hear every now and then and to ask questions now and then, you know, yeah. that's, that's what I find is most helpful for me because when I ask the question and I get it repeated or get the answer repeated in a slightly different way, then I get a real deeper understanding of it. Right. It, it gives you the clarity of what what they meant the first time so that it fits what is going on in your head. Exactly. Well, well I don't like, want it to fit what's going on in no, my head. No, I, I don't. I don't going on in my head to fit what you're saying. To, right. To get the two representations as close as possible with the two people. And right. Yeah. You know, and, and now that actually, actually was a really good example of the the listening, reflecting, and and getting a um, a clarification. That happens almost all the time in 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 really good communication. You know, when I don't necessarily understand exactly what you say, so I'll I'll repeat it back in the way I understand it. And you say, no, 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 that's not what I meant. This is what I meant. Or you might say, yeah, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So that kind of feedback is really, really important in, in successful communication. So I have a question for you. Okay. Do you know what, you probably do, but I'm, I'll, I'll ask this rhetorically. <laughs> what, is, what percent is your responsibility in communication? I see it as, well, I'm 100% responsible for my part of the communication. Exactly. Whether I'm speaking or whether I'm listening. That's that's my answer. Right. And I believe that actually applies to the entire communication. If things aren't going well, I have to take some responsibility and um, do what I can to correct the communication. That doesn't mean to tell you that you're doing it all wrong, but <laughs> rather to tell you how I am feeling about the situation. Right. And this is part of the problem. You know, uh, the way people communicate, they'll often say things like, man, you're shouting at me or you're blaming me or this or that or the other thing. Uh, and while well, there may actually be some blame going on, usually that's not really what's happening, you know? 
sometimes though, if I say to you, as, a, as just a simple example, uh, I'm feeling neglected, let's say. What people don't understand is the word neglected is not a feeling, it's a thought. And when I say I am feeling neglected, what I'm suggesting is someone is neglecting me and uh, I think it's you, but I don't want to say you're neglecting me. So I say I feel neglected. And really, that's it's not a feeling at all. If I were to be truthfully honest and vulnerable, I might say something instead like, you know, Linda, I, I'm feeling some sadness right now, and I'm also I'm, I'm noticing that I'm getting defensive. And I think there's a story I'm making up in my head that you're you're just not really here for me. You're you're kind of out there somewhere. This is the story I'm making up on my, in my head. Now I know that that's all my projection, and it may or may not be true about you. But I just want to share that with you because right now it's making it hard for me to stay vulnerable and present. Now, that's a lot different than saying I'm feeling neglected. But you're getting a different reaction. You, you on the other side are hearing it completely different. When I, when I open up vulnerably like that, then you become more willing to maybe adjust your, the way you present yourself. But when I say I'm feeling neglected, even though I didn't say you're neglecting me, you hear it as I'm neglecting you. And the defense right? goes up and That's right. yeah. and yeah. then and it escalates from there. But the, right. you know, the when I first heard the concept of responsibility being a hundred percent, I was like, no, 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 it's 50-50. Yeah, right. <laughs> it, it's like, no, it really is a hundred percent. And you described it beautifully because we each need to put our best and that doesn't mean the other person is going to understand however if they don't how can we talk to them in a way or and it may not be talk it may be right it may be move it may be touch it may be whatever that to give them as close to what we're trying to convey as possible whether they choose to receive it or not, that we don't have control over that, unfortunately. But yeah, well, that's an interesting point. I, I kind of thought that's where you were going with the whole responsibility question. Um, there's two people involved in a conversation, so each one is half has has to bear half the responsibility for the outcome. I think, in some sense, that is probably accurate. But each of us has to bring 100% responsibility. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's, I think, what it is. And, and I think that just to allow people to ponder that, because that isn't right. something that we're necessarily taught as we're growing up as adults. <laughs> you know, some, some people who have done tremendous personal growth work have figured that out, but not everybody has had that opportunity. And, I know when I've shared you know, that message, people, they're, they're like, really? What? How? Well, and you can see my interpretation is I see their wheels spinning in their heads trying to process, oh, okay, maybe I haven't been taking the responsibility in the communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good point. You know, and there's a, there's a common phrase that I've heard people say. Uh, you have two ears and one mouth, so you're supposed to listen twice as much as you speak or something. And I thought, you know, that is such a ridiculous statement. It is completely absurd. And I, I believe it's just a fabrication made by Victorian age parents who are trying to control their kids. Because another one that came along with them was it's better to be seen and not heard. You know, that was one that I used to hear a lot at home. Better to be seen than not heard. And... Uh, but it's not, it's not true at all. When I understand that parents want to control their kids and they want, want them to be well behaved, I, that, I understand that. However, when we're having communication, it's 50 50, you know, on average. On average, it's 50 50. That is to say, you know, you're going to be speaking half the time and I'm going to be listening half the time, and vice versa. Sometimes it may be 100% one way or the other. 
you know, if you really have a lot that you need to say and get off your chest, then it's my job to just be quiet and listen. You know, sometimes that happens. But I think on average, if we take all conversations around the world that are happening at any given time, it's about 50-50. If it really were the case that people were listening twice as much as they were talking, um, then everybody would be listening. There would be no talking. There's no time for it. <laughs> I'm sure you can find a mathematical equation. <laughs> <just saying>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, so so th what do you think? Well, we've probably touched on this already. The biggest reason for communication failure. I think it comes down to like what I talked about, what is represented in each person's mind of what they think is going on in that conversation. And so the, I've used the term fantasy escalation. That's a great <laughs> term. I like that. <laughs> I, I can't give full, I mean, I'll, I'll give credit to, to Matt Browning, who I heard it from first, but the, the idea is we have these fantasy escalations be, or we have these internal representations of what's going on. We, I'm thinking about um, what I'm going to have for lunch and I'm trying to express that to you. You know, it's like, oh, I'm hungry. Okay. What does that mean? You know, I want to eat something. Well, what do you want to eat? And, you know, if, if you have no idea, then any food would do. And so in your mind, you might be thinking, I don't know what, let, I'm, I'm going to make this up, grilled steak. And somebody else is thinking salad and, you know, totally different yep. ideas of what mm -hmm. the food is. So if you don't actually talk about it, then one person is going to create this meal, for example, for the other person. And they're not going to be happy because maybe maybe the steak eater is trying to prepare food for a vegetarian but doesn't realize they're a vegetarian and that wouldn't work well. But this comes into play in arguments where somebody makes up an idea of what's happening and then they argue or express something based on what they've made up. So they have a fantasy in their head. They've made up this idea of what the other person is saying, and then they get mad <laughs> or they get upset. And then the other person doesn't quite know why they're mad because they weren't trying to share something upsetting. And they get into this argument and it escalates, but it's about nothing. That's right. <laughs> so that's that's why getting curious. And if there's something you don't understand, you know, it's like, how dare they said whatever it is? And, you know, it's like, you know, what do you mean I'm not doing the, you know? And then you start arguing about it. It's like, no, I. It had nothing to do with you. The fact that I'm tired was just because I'm tired, not because of anything else or I'm bored it has nothing to do with you, you know, and making sure you understand what is going on there can help figure out so that you're actually talking about the same topic you're right. <laughs> and the same issue. You're right. Yeah. Th this, uh, this concept, the, the, uh, fall not fallacy, fantasy, fantasy. Uh, oh, I like what Aaron said. If in doubt, ask, did you mean what I heard? <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah, get, get clarification. This is what I heard. Is this what you mean? And, and that's kind of what we were talking about a moment ago, the, the idea of reflection, being able to reflect what, I've, what you've heard. So sometimes, you know, if I, I have noticed that some people, uh, when we're in conversation, they seem to speak quickly, or they at least in in a in a speed that's too fast for me to process. Mm -hmm. And sometimes what I have to do is I say, "Well, can we slow this down for a second? Because I'm 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 feeling a little bit overwhelmed at the moment, and I would just like to reflect back 
take a, bit, a moment to reflect back what I've heard so far. Is that okay with you? And that's almost 90, 100% of the time people are going to say, oh, yeah, sure, no problem. And, uh, and then just reflect back what you've heard without judgment, of course. Just simply say, this is what I've heard. Is this, is this what you meant? Is this, mm -hmm. Am I understanding you correctly? Right. So that's a really important piece. So thank you for that, Sarah. Uh, and then the, Marissa adds, it's been my experience that we add meaning to what we hear based on our filters and interpretations. I absolutely agree with that. And often what we made up is based on total misunderstandings causing a lot of upset. Absolutely. Um, so this idea of Perfect. fantasy. You yeah. Know, so it's so like, what you're making up, is, yeah, it's that fantasy. Exactly. And then you're expressing you something based right. on that and then it escalates. So I had, I had a friend um, who, who used the word hallucination. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the hallucination I make up as a result of what you told me is this. And he owns it right up front. And I like that because when he says that, then I know he's talking about himself. He's not trying to project his stuff onto me. And that is that is what you call mature communication, recognizing that you make up your own stories about whatever the other person is saying, and you own it. You own it up front. And so that's, you know, you. I don't like the word hallucination in general. I mean, I think it's a bit much, but the story I'm making up about that is and blah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because and I think by expressing that and ta and bringing it up up front, saying, "I know I don't usually ask this, however," <laughs> and you know, or this may seem odd, but I want to get clarity around this because maybe maybe up until now you haven't had those kind of conversations with people, and right. you want to start doing it. And people are going to be like, why are you asking me this? But if you frame it, use whatever word feels comfortable to you, whether it's the story I made, you know, I think right. that's probably a, a more universally acceptable term. <laughs> it doesn't, oh. doesn't have all the other ideas around it, but just what I'm, what I'm hearing and how I'm interpreting it is this, and I want to make sure, is that what you mean? Right. And because before you get upset, because I believe me, I've got I've gone down that rabbit hole of like jumping to a conclusion and thinking, oh, they're, you know, I read an email and it's like, oh, my gosh, they want me to do X, Y, Z. I don't want to do that or, you know, and go down this like, why are they being so mean and blah, 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 blah. blah. And they're just like throwing out a suggestion of something and it's like we can talk about it yeah. it's just <laughs> so yeah it could be written communication and i think texting and emails can be misinterpreted probably even more than in person because we don't have the intonations we don't have how the tone is we don't we don't really, we don't see the facial expressions. We're, you know, so it's more apt for miscommunication. Right. And heaven forbid that you actually type something in all caps. Oh yeah. I got it. I got an email from somebody the other day that was all caps and I was like, what? Yeah. But you know, I, I also know that this, this is an older relative and you know, I'm just going to say it. Just she just didn't realize the caps were on, or I have no idea, but it, it was I didn't take it personally. <laughs> right. Marissa just mentions here that asking questions leads to greater clarity and less miscommunication. Well, that's precisely what we were talking about. I think that at the beginning we said that the key to understanding has to do with, with curiosity. And but authentic curiosity, not not prurient. Oh, I like that word, prurient curiosity. I don't know where that came from. It just popped into my head. So um, her 88-year-old mother always types in caps. She finds it easier. Okay, cool. Uh, but it's interesting how, depending on who you're communicating with, like I, when I'm doing text, if I want to emphasize a particular word or something, I might put that in all caps. And I've had people complain to me, what are you doing yelling at me? Come on, I'm not yelling. I'm just emphasizing a particular word. 
<laughs> it's it's pretty funny, but that's exactly the situation that we have to deal with. Um, and of course, I don't know about you, but when somebody somebody makes an accusation of that type, it's easy to go into defensive mode and start saying, right. "Wait a minute, that's not what I'm doing." Yeah, you know. Well, and and the other piece is fascinating. Is it depends on the mood that I'm in, how I interpret something. So of I may course. have this playful banter with somebody and then all of a sudden it annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, you know, or, you know, it's like, why are they saying that? Or how offensive? And then it's like, but I have a history of a playful banter with this person, but why today in this moment am I taking it personally? And, right. you know, and so noticing that for myself and that, that may be something that's helpful for others is you know what what's happening if if something is bothering you what else may be going on and is yeah. it is it really what is being said or is it how you choose to interpret it in that moment and you know like if you just heard some bad news and then somebody tries to tell you a joke you might not find it as funny as you would have at another time. Sure. Yeah, that's that, that's that's quite true. You know, the the, um, the 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 you may get triggered by something that somebody says, and it you know maybe a perfectly innocent phrase, but it might be spoken in a certain way that who, who knows? It reminds you of your mother when you were five years old. Mm -hmm. And so you're you're responding to that old wound from right. years ago, and people will 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 speak up if they say anything about triggers. They say, "Man, you just triggered me." Already, they're pointing the finger of blame, like it's your fault that I'm feeling this right now, right. rather than saying, "Oh, I'm just noticing I'm feeling triggered right now." You know, and that's a, and the other person might say, "Oh, well, what's going on?" I say, you know, when you said X, Y, and Z, it, I just had this flashback to when I was five years old. And my mom was yelling at me about something. She used that exact phrase. And I think there was something about, you know, maybe the way you're, the way you lifted your eyebrows or some silly thing like that, 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 you know, brought me back to that memory. And I'm not blaming you. It's not your fault. I'm just letting you know that's what happened. It's, 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 in, it's my issue, not yours. And I'm not asking you to change anything. I'm just letting you know that's what happened. So that's that's an important part of of communication. You know, it's hey, taking responsibility means owning your own stuff. And when you get triggered, speak honestly about it, but try not to blame the other person for the trigger because right. they didn't put it there. Right. Like they they it's like walking along and then hitting a landmine. It's like, yeah, right. <laughs> what, what right. did I do? <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I shouldn't have stepped there. <laughs> well, okay, but there was nothing to give me any hint that there was something there not to step on, you know? So that's, it's really, really good that, uh, you know, that you're, that you're bringing this up. And as I've said before, communication is like the most valuable tool that anybody can learn. I think what Marissa says, it's too bad we weren't taught all these amazing communication skills in school. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. In fact, they are taught almost the exact opposite. If you notice that the way our schools are right now, they want kids to, to share their feelings, right? And uh, But what kind of statements do they use? I feel like. I feel as if. I feel that. And so on. Those aren't feelings at all. Those are thoughts masquerading as feelings. And if we were to be totally honest, we would stop using phrases like that and say, my opinion is, or I think, or the thought I have, or the story I'm making up, or all kinds of things that we could say differently. And the true feeling would be, and I feel sad about that, or I feel angry about that, or I feel happy about that, you know? There's let the feel let the word feel actually talk about feelings, i.e., sensations in your body or emotions in your heart, but not thoughts coming out of your head. 
And just talking about feelings, that's something I've found quite interesting with different clients that I work with. Some are very in tune with their feelings and can find, you know, oh, I'm feeling melancholy or I'm feeling sad or I'm feeling happy or I'm feeling... Others have harder times initially tapping into what is it that I'm feeling. Of course. And being aware that if you aren't sure what you're feeling, to start noticing. And I know for me personally, when I first got out of my marriage, I didn't know what I was feeling. I had a very, you know, if you've ever seen those pictures with like all the different feeling, you know, like the different faces that have the different descriptions of feelings before. Mm -hmm. I was in a group where they would ask us to, you know, what are you feeling right now? And people would say good or fine. And yeah, and that's like, no, 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 no. What, yeah, what, pick, what feeling is that actually? Pick, pick one of these. And, and yeah, right. it was fascinating how many people who've gone through significant trauma have difficulty identifying their feelings. Right. And, and so that's something that I had to work on to reconnect to what am I feeling? I don't have to take what somebody else is telling me as what I'm feeling. I can actually feel what I'm feeling. Right. And, well, and, and I think it's, it's actually worse than that. I think um, as well being as, as well meaning as most parents really are, they actually teach us as children really dysfunctional behavior patterns. Uh, and not just to give a simple example, um, most boys of my you know, generation were taught not to show any sadness or fear. Anger's okay, you're allowed to show anger. So when we're feeling sadness or fear, what do we do? We get angry, right? Now, women on the other hand are told not to show anger. But it's okay to show sadness or fear. So when women get angry, what do they do? They start crying. They show sadness. They, this, is, this is a horrible thing that we've done to children. We've disallowed them to experience the feelings and to express them truthfully. We've told them, we've taught all of them how to lie about their feelings. And so consequently, when they become adults, They've, they've become so used to lying about their feelings throughout their childhood and adolescence and into young adulthood that by the time they're adults, you ask them to tell you what their true feelings are. Well, that fear around being truthful is so strong that they're not going to tell you. They'll tell you something different. And so this is something that, you know, we have to, we have to heal this as a, a global thing. It's got to be a global thing. Definitely. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm trying to come up with what, what to, I just, I'm, yes, we definitely are not, like somebody mentioned, we're not taught this in school in the manner that is actually helpful. I think maybe now some teachers in some schools are starting to teach this and there's a little sure bit more. So. There's a little bit more awareness. At least I've seen photos of kids meditating. So that gives me hope that maybe right. there's a shift happening. However, these are so such basic fundamental skills that we all need, whether it's speaking one-on-one -on -one to a close partner, whether it's in a business setting, whether it's to a group of people and all of these still apply you know and i've had people say well when i'm talking to a group how do i know if they're really understanding and yeah you're not going to be able to have the same kind of in-depth questioning that you would if you're talking one-on-one -on -one. however if you start getting questions that they're not understanding this part of what 
you presented, for example, or you're, they're not getting clear on this, you know for the next time how to improve that to help give people more information that may help them understand even better. It may not, you know, you can answer as best you can in the moment. And if you aren't able to give all of the information or you can change and modify things for the future. And that that's true if in a business setting, if people are asking certain questions, then maybe maybe the specifics, like if I'm giving generalizations and I keep getting questions about the specifics of something, it gives me the clue, oh, maybe I need to give more specifics right. to this person or these people. And, and then other people, it's like, well, what's the big picture? I don't understand the big picture. You're giving all the details. What, what's the, <laughs> then, <laughs> then you need to share. <laughs> That's the, right. Sometimes it seems like you can't win for losing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, you're absolutely right. I, but there's, you see, we're talking about two different kinds of communication now. In the one case, we were talking about uh, an intimate conversation, say, between two people right. who are just trying to communicate about something. And in the other case, we're talking about doing a presentation. And in that case, in the second case, you have a little bit bigger challenge because, first of all, you while you might have some idea of the overall makeup of your audience, you don't know necessarily the specifics of individuals in the audience. So consequently, you'll try to make your presentation satisfy as many of the people as possible, knowing that there's some risk that one or two or maybe even a few more might, might not get what you're saying at all. Yeah. And, then, and there are all sorts of techniques in that regard, and I don't think we have time to go into all of that. <laughs> right, right. Well, I think we're, we're, we're more interested here in this conversation or in our conversation right now about how to have communication with somebody that you're close to um you know and whether wanna, it's a I you know, also intimate point relationship the, oh sorry no sorry the the word communication is a noun it's not a verb communicate so we are communicating like communication it's like what do you do with that it's this thing it's an object, it's not an action. And so to actually make it an action and to be communicating is what we're talking about. Of course, yeah. Um, and the thing that, that I think we, we have to understand is David, I you're frozen for me, so I'm not sure if other people can. Okay. All right. Well, I'll I'll share a little bit while he is thawing. That when when we're talking about communication and communicating with people who are in our world, who are meaning something you know, who are important to us because we talk to people all the time, everywhere, whether it's a clerk in the store, whether it's a neighbor, whether it's a friend or family member. But if you have somebody special in your life and you want to make sure that they understand what you're expressing, it's important to really be able to do that. And what we've talked about, we've talked about being curious, finding out what it is that they mean, what it is that we mean, making sure that we're understanding that. We're also talking about listening. And no, you can't listen more than you talk because we've already talked about that, then nobody would talk at all. But <laughs> having that, the curiosity, the presence, the listening, so just paying attention. And those are key things for communication. And welcome back, David. 
I have no idea. That's never happened to me here before. Uh, it was well, like I kept going. <laughs> so. I got like I got three pop ups on my screen telling me the communication has. How about that communication failure? That isn't that interesting. <laughs> See, that was what, perfect. What the, perfect. You never know yeah. when there's going to be. A so I'm sorry about failure. that. Yeah, but thank you for covering, and uh, I hope no I see Sarah and Marissa both mentioned that I was frozen. Well, I, well, I, I wasn't I, actually frozen, but... but. <laughs> well, what I said <laughs> is, I, 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 I said that you were frozen for me, and then people started to chat, so I realized that, yeah, yeah. It, was, that it wasn't that yeah. I was frozen and, you know... So. Yeah, no, I know. Anyway, uh, so I'm not really frozen. I love it. I love it. The story that I made. Thank you guys for, for covering for me. <laughs> That's right. Um, so I think what I was talking about was the difference between dialogue and communication. Mm -hmm. And where dialogue is one way or can be one way. And communication is generally a two-way street. And that's what we've really been talking about here today. And you, I, I heard some of your summary and, you know, some of the things that we've been talking about, like curiosity and all that. These are all really, really important things. And we also took a detour into feelings, which I think is important. Um, so I, <laughs> I just saw Marissa's comment. <laughs> That's hilarious. The story I made up was that you were frozen, David. Very good. Thank you for that, Marissa. That helps me to smile a bit more. And so let me ask you this, Linda. If you were to uh, offer one major tip for improvement in communication, one-on-one -on -one communication, what would that tip be? And how would you recommend practicing it? The one tip is how I started, is being curious. And when there's something that is not clear or that you don't understand or you find yourself making up that story in your head or feeling that reaction to something, as David said, that trigger, pausing and allowing yourself to ask the other person, this is what's happening for me. I'm just curious. What what did you mean? Or, or even if you don't share what's happening with you, just could you clarify what you mean? Because sometimes we'll use a word that, you know, food. Well, what does food mean? You know, that's a very normal thing, but happy. What does happy mean? How do you, what is going to make you feel happy? And we can go on another topic on that, but just like clarifying, what is it? the definition that they're meaning for the words that they're using in their communication so that you can get a better understanding to not make up that story that is not true. Right. There's, there's another point that I'd like to add to that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think uh, Sarah had mentioned this earlier and I, I, I forgot to comment on it. Uh, I think she said, uh, we, we have different understandings of what words mean. And that can be, even if this, if we all agree on one word, what it means, it can still have variations across cultures. Mm -hmm. So you have to take into account, you know, the, the, the culture and the background of the other person that you're speaking to when they use a particular word, it might not mean the same thing that you're used to having it mean. So, you know, try to have a little bit of empathy and, um, you know, for that kind of situation. So, yeah. Well, Linda, I know even though I messed up by, by disappearing and having a communication failure right in the middle of this conversation, <laughs> uh, I just have to say we're getting close to the end. So I was wondering if there's uh, anything that you would like to say to complete our conversation here today. Well, I'm grateful to be here. I'm, I'd love to stay in touch with any of you who want to stay connected. And you can find me at lindashively.com. And on that, there's a fun quiz you can take that gives you some insights to help tame your joy-stealing dragons, which we didn't talk about today. But if you have those, you can get some more insight to 
help you move forward and get stop self-sabotaging yourself. Right. I'll make sure to add that to the recording page when this is done. And we actually did do a full episode on the joy, joy stealing dragons back in, God, it's over a year now. I think it's probably closer to two years, but uh, yeah. Well, anyway, thank you for being here, Linda. It's just been a, a blast as always. I, I always enjoy these conversations with you. And um, I'm sure, you know, you're going to be on again sometime. Who knows when? So thank I you. Look, I look forward to it. I look forward to it. These conversations are as enjoyable for me as I hope they are for the people who are listening. Right. Yeah. Well, that's certainly true for me. I'll, I, but I can't speak for everybody else. I guess they'll have to speak for themselves. But meanwhile, I just want to say thank you all for being present on the live presentation. Those of you who, sh who joined us today, thank you. And if you happen to be watching the, the recording, well, thank you for being here and doing that. And I just like to remind people that the recording for this and every other episode I do uh, will be on my website at lifemasterytv.com, life-mastery-tv.com. I truly hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. Uh, in, an, in an hour or two after this thing is over, you'll receive an email from the Learn It Live platform uh, offering you the opportunity to do a review. I really, really encourage you to write a review, write a couple of sentences about what you loved about this show so other people can benefit from that. And finally, I'd like to remind everybody to practice the life mastery mantra on a daily basis if you can. It goes like this. I gratefully forgive the imperfect being I have been in the past. I gratefully accept the magnificent being I am right now. I gratefully welcome the evolved being I am becoming in each new moment. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. I wish you love, light, and blessings on your continuing journey. And uh, I'll see you next time on Life Mastery TV. Bye-bye.